All right. So we are on story 50. And uh, this is going to be uh, interesting because we're going <coughs> to see. Now, remember we were talking about <coughs> how Jesus is, is, is getting the attention of the masses. We got the crowd. He's also get, he has continuously gathered the, intent, the attention of the religious leaders. And that's an important thing as well. And not only the religious leaders, but then people that were sitting in, in seats of, uh, of, of authority. Now we saw in, the, in previous stories how he called Matthew the tax collector. And uh, how Matthew was not one that was looked upon favorably. That the job that he had was a job that was collecting taxes from your people to give to the oppressor, the Roman people. And Jesus called Matthew and said, you come and follow me. And so we're going to see that even some more of these leaders of that day, and we saw how the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, were looking at Jesus and wondering, why are you doing things a certain way? And, and questioning in, them, in their hearts and minds. But Jesus would, would hear their questions and, because he is, he is God in the flesh and would, and would uh, answer them with a direct statement even though they were pondering thoughts in their hearts and in their minds. So we're going to see some more of that on today. Um, and uh, it's important that we keep in mind, we're going to touch on one of these things that people have a real big issue with, and that's the Sabbath day. And we're going to try to talk about uh, a little bit about that and uh, I'm going to try to shed some, uh, some light from my point of view. And uh, like I said, there's this, this is uh, a subject that people have a lot of issues and a lot of hang-ups about. Uh, but I'm going to give you what I think the scripture is saying and uh, just take a quick listen though before we go, go any deeper. Story 50, uh, plucking the grains on the Sabbath. Story 50, plucking grain on the Sabbath. Now it came about at that time, Jesus was passing through some cornfields on a Sabbath and his disciples were hungry and began to make their way, plucking the ears, rubbing them with their hands, and eating. But some of the Pharisees saw this, and they said to him, Look, why do you and your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered and said to them, Did you not read what David did when he was in need, and he was hungry, himself and those with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest? And he took and ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor those with him, except the priests alone. And he also gave to those who were with him. For did you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say to you that one greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this is, I desire kindness and not sacrifice you would have not condemned the blameless. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Story 51. Let me stop that there. Alright. Before we go into story 51, let's finish up with story 50. So, uh, we see a situation here where Jesus and his disciples are walking. And what we see here is it says that now it came about uh, uh, at, the, at that time Jesus was passing through some cornfields. And it could be corn or wheat, you know, depending on how, how you want to uh, uh, read the, the uh, original uh, writings. It says, but it was on the Sabbath. And that's the key thing. All right. It says that his disciples were hungry. So, they were, number one, it's the Sabbath day. Now, one of the other things is they were walking. And there's a certain thing about the Sabbath day about how far you can walk. So they're walking. But here's the big issue. With them being hungry, they began to make their way uh, and plucking the ears. So number one, they plucked the ears. They pulled them off. And number two, they were rubbing them in their hands. Now, according to the law of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had begun to do work. Excuse me. And the Pharisees had put together this legalism uh, uh, this lengthy list of legalistic rules about the Sabbath. And there were certain things that you just could not do. 
Now, even today, they still have certain things uh, like that. Um, one of the things that you'll see on the Sabbath day, if you go to, uh, to Israel or to certain areas that are predominantly Orthodox Jewish uh, uh, populated, they have things which is called Sabbath elevators. And so on the Sabbath day, the elevator uh, will stop at every floor because they believe that pushing the button is uh, moving electricity, which they believe is starting a fire. And they say you can't start a fire because it's against the, the, the rules. So they won't turn off any electrical or turn on any electrical appliances. And they all stems back to this lengthy list of legalistic uh, uh, rules that were passed down. And even till, the, till this day, some of the Orthodox Jews still have a lot of them. And we, I can go into stories and stories that I have heard of and different things that I have uh, 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 experienced with dealing with, with uh, situations where these uh, things become an issue. I worked with a guy that was a, 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 an Orthodox uh, Jew, and he had so many different things that he had to do on certain days, and uh, he would tell me many stories about what he did and could not do on the Sabbath day. But the point is, and I can, we will spend a lot of time on that because it is lengthy, but the point is that it was a Sabbath day, and from the, the Pharisee standpoint, they were breaking the law. Now, they were breaking the law how they interpreted it. See, that's the thing to keep in mind. They were looking at this Sabbath day was supposed to be a way that you could, you could uh, show forth your, your goodness to the Lord. Now, what the Pharisees did, they wanted the, the, the Sabbath day to be a way that they can look holy and deep. Look at what I don't do on the Sabbath. And that's basically what legalism is all about. Legalism is a way for, for an individual to try to look sanctimonious, to try to look like they are doing something uh, wonderful, something that, that you, should be, uh, you should admire me for the sacrifices that I make and for the, the, uh, the efforts that I go through to show my allegiance to God. And it's all about self-grandization and, and self-lifting up. And it's a prideful act. And that was what that whole list of legalistic laws were really all about. And Jesus knew about it. He knew that the only reason these people did what they did was to be uh, praised by the people. They wanted the people's attention the, per the people's accolade. They didn't care about God. They, they cared about their own personal uh, uh, um, uh, public opinion and how people viewed them and what people said about them and they just love the praises of men way more than the praises of God. All right? So that's the, uh, the, the gist behind why they had all these different rules. It says, it says, um, it says some of the, the Pharisees saw this and they said to him, look, why do you and your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Now, they straight up said, tell Jesus, you and your disciples are doing something that's not lawful. Which is interesting because what that does say then is that they are basically saying to Jesus, we understand the law and the word of God given to, given to Moses better than you do. And that's part of the problem that we have even today. Today we got so many so-called scholars and so many experts and university professors that that will tell you what the Bible is and what it means and they don't uh, uh, understand it because Jesus, and we'll see this as we go through it, said that if you don't read the Bible in the spirit, you will not understand it. And that's an important thing because you have to receive the Bible as a spiritual uh, communication and not a natural. If you read the Bible in just the natural, in just reading the words, all you're going to get is nouns and verbs and adjectives. You're just going to get, you know, uh, uh, literature. But if you read it with the heart seeking God, you will read the literature, but you're going to receive living spirit. That's why Jesus talks about the word of God as being alive. And so it will actually talk and, and commune with your spirit because Jesus is the word and he's in the word, which is why even though when we went through that study on all the different Bibles, the thing that, that, that I try to point out 
is it doesn't really matter if you're seeking God. God will speak to you through his word no matter what man had tried to put over it or, or, or corrupt it or to try to do anything. Now the people that try to do that, woe unto them. That's what the scripture says. They're going to be in trouble. But you're not going to stop God's spirit from speaking to your heart if you genuinely want to know his word. It don't matter which Bible you pick up, uh, so to speak. Yet, are there Bibles that I would say stay away from? Yeah, I'd say stay away from certain Bibles. But at the same time, if that's the only one you got and you're looking for an answer for, from the Lord, the Lord will, work, will, will, will speak to you through his word, no matter how, it's tried to, how man has tried to taint it. But as we keep going on, it says, and what we see is Jesus' answer. It says, and Jesus answered and said to them, did you not read? Now, right there, he's telling you, you did not, even though I know you read the word, but you didn't read the spirit. He goes, did you not read? And he's talking about the word of God. What David did when he was in need and was, uh, was hungry. And that story can be found in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 21, verse 6, where David is uh, on, the, on the run and he comes into the, uh, the house of the Lord. And there is, uh, and his men, are, him and his men are hungry and there's, there's no food. But there was the, uh, the consecrated bread that was there that was supposed to be only for the priest. But the priest allowed David and his men to eat. Because they were, their, their need for, for nutrition was above that their need for sanctimonious uh, 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 rule keeping for just rule keeping sake. And uh, both David and the priest at that time understood that. And so Jesus is pointing that out. And he goes, did you not read that David when he was in need uh, and he was hunger himself and those with him, how... He entered into the house of God uh, at the time of, of, of um, uh, Amamathor, the high priest, and he looked and ate, I'm just going to say he, and he took and ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for uh, those with him, except for the priest alone. All right? And he also gave it to those that were with him. So he's saying, all right, number one, did you not read that? So here's a situation where you can see that having need is more important than trying to keep some sanctimonious rule. All right. Plus, a couple of things you can pick out of here. When people start talking about, well, I wonder, you know, how true is the, the word of God or, or, or all the stories we read in the Bible. Well, here's Jesus telling them about David. And he's talking about David as a true historical person. So Jesus authenticates the life and the, and the activities of David. And, and then he's also authenticating where it was written. And this story was written in 1 Samuel. So Jesus is given authentication and given credence to the Old Testament writings. Right? Which is important to keep in mind because our scholars today, they try to tear them down. Well, it's not, you know, they're saying, how do we know this really happened? And, you know, who, who, who can we really you said get? First get, Samuel's chapter. First Samuel chapter 21, verse 6, is where you can find that story about David going into the temple. All right? And, um, and then he goes on. And he says, Or did you read, here he is again, asking them, <laughs> do you really read the word of God? Have you really? been in the scriptures and more than likely yes they did read the words but have you gone past the words and allow the word to speak to you, you know, through your heart are you just reading the natural text are you reading the nouns the verbs and the adjectives or are you reading the spirit through the spirit and so he says or did you read in the law uh, that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless but I say unto you, one greater than the temple is here. So, what is he saying? Well, on the Sabbath day, what is the occupation of the priest? The priests are, are the ones that are supposed to receive the animals and to, uh, and to, to slay them and to, and to offer them up as a burnt offering. Well, that's work. 
So on the Sabbath day, the priests are what? Immune to the law of the Sabbath because they're the ones that have to offer up the sacrifice. So the priests are immune. That means the Sabbath law has no what? No jurisdiction on the priests because they, on the Sabbath, are the ones that have to actually do the work of bringing the sacrifices and, and offering the sacrifices up. All right? So uh, even though the Sabbath rule was for the, the, the general population, the priests, their, their job was to do the work of the, the sacrifice. And that required activity and work. Uh, and you can get an example of that in Numbers 28 and 9. All right? Uh, it gives you a description of that. All right? And so, but then he says, but then one greater than the temple is here. So if the priests were immune because they were doing the work in the temple, but Jesus says, well, then if, the, if the, the priests are immune, what about me? Wouldn't I be immune? Because I'm greater than the temple. Right? And those that are with me, wouldn't they be immune? Because they're with me. So he, he, he's showing them not just in one area where they didn't do wrong, they, they, were, they were justified for taking the grain. He's showing them two points. See, if you looked at it from this angle, you would see that we didn't do anything wrong. We didn't violate anything. Or if you look at it from this angle, we didn't do anything wrong and we didn't violate anything. So Jesus shows them two points of view that they could have looked at to see that him and his disciples were not guilty of doing anything against their law. Now, what the, the Pharisees were upset was is that you're not look making the you're making us look uh, 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 a little off because we talk about how how we don't eat and, and we we won't do this and all the different sacrifices we do, but then here you are just doing stuff nilly willy, so to speak, from their point of view, and they are concerned because their images their image is the thing that they're more concerned about. That's what they're con they're, they're trying to to preserve. And so he goes on, he says, and if you had known what this is, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now he quotes another scripture, he's quoting from, from Hosea uh, chapter 6, verse 6, uh, that the Lord the, the delights in, in mercy or, or I did, uh, in, in not allowing people to have hardship, right? But I'd rather see the mercy shown rather than you trying to impress people with how much you sacrifice. Look at how much I go through. Look at how much I do. And they're only doing it not because they're trying to uh, really develop a closer relationship with the Lord. That they're, they're doing it so that they can get they can look at be looked at by people as being impressive. I'm trying to impress you with my holiness or with my my ability to keep rigorous laws. And um, that's not something that uh, is going to be um, uh, looked upon with joy by the Lord. And he goes on. And he says, you would not have condemned uh, the blameless. He said, if you had understood that, you wouldn't have condemned the blameless. And Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, this is a very important thing here because what it's saying is that Jesus, um, number one, he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was made for man, not man from the Sabbath. And what we'll also see as we continue to go through this, and this is a good point, this good, good position here to start making this point, is that remember, all of the types and all of the, the laws and all of the festivals and all of the prophecies that were given in the Old Testament were all about who? Jesus. Jesus. They were all about him. And he's going to say a little bit later, you know, you search the scriptures diligently trying to find eternal life. But the scriptures speak about me. Speaking about the, they speak about Jesus. But the thing that we keep in mind is that he fulfilled all of this. Even the the Old Testament law that was given by Moses that you should uh, observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, Jesus is going to fulfill that, so we're no longer going to be under that obligation. Mm -hmm. Now, what some people try to say is that, well, yeah, but the Sabbath was started way before. It was before Moses, and, and, and it was. But then I say to this, well, when Jesus came, when Jesus uh, came and when he's going to come again and all the stuff that he fulfills is he only just fulfilling the law of Moses or is he fulfilling everything that was written and my, my take on is that he's fulfilling everything 
right? Because you can go back when when um, uh, Abraham was was told by God to offer up his son Isaac. That was before Moses. But what kind of type was that? It was a type of the father offering up his what? His son. Well, who fulfilled that? Jesus. And even in, even in the writing and in, in, in the story, it says that Abraham said to, when, his, when Isaac said, where is this sacrifice? He said, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. And he did. Well, and that was before, but that was, that, that picture, that type was fulfilled in Jesus' uh, death, burial, and resurrection. Or you can go even further back. When Adam first sinned, and he went and hid himself, him and Eve. And then when they recognized that their, that their sin took the glory of God away and they found themselves, what, naked? He went and, 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 and uh, sewed together fig leaves to cover his nakedness. And when God saw them and said, you know, you know where are you, uh, Adam? And, and he gave them that, that, that whole uh, dialogue. And he then went and made him coats of what? Of skin. And so he slew the first, God himself slew the first animal and covered man's nakedness, which is what we're covered with what? Our sin is covered with the righteousness of who? Of God. Well, what was the type? Did, did, who fulfilled that type? Jesus. He was the one that, he was the, 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 the one that was slain to cover our sin, to cover our, 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 our nakedness. So that was fulfilled. And that's way before the, the law of Moses. So when we start looking at Jesus fulfilling, not just l limiting our aspect of understanding what he fulfilled. He not only fulfilled the laws of Moses, he also fulfilled the prophets that were prophesied. And there's still yet some that, that were prophesied that still he is going to fulfill in his second coming and during the millennial reign. And, and doing the judgment after the millennial reign. All those things are going to be fulfilled by Jesus. But he also fulfilled the, 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 the covenants that were done by Adam. And the covenants by um, Abraham. And even the covenant by, by Noah. Because Noah was and his family were told to build an ark. And they were told to what? To get in the ark. And the ark was that ark of safety. That ark represents who? If you're in the ark, you are what? Safe. If you're in Christ, you are what? Safe. So he fulfilled all of that. So he is the fulfillment of all the New Testament, of all the Old Testament writings, not just the fulfillment of, of Moses. So when people say then that, well, Jesus fulfilled all of the Mosaic writings, but the Sabbath was not under the Mosaic writings, my statement then is, well, yes, Jesus did fulfill the Mosaic writings, but he also fulfilled all of the covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Adamic covenant with, with, from under Adam, the, the covenant with Noah, and the Mosaic covenant. Jesus fulfilled them all. So we're not under any obligation to any of those covenants. Our main focus now is who? Jesus. And we focus on what he has is, is, is said to us. A lot of people want to still go back and grab some of that stuff because they want to do what the Pharisees did. I want to do that so I can look deep. I can look wonderful. I can look knowledgeable. And my thing is, no, just be uh, grateful that the Lord did all that. He did that work for us. We don't have... Now, if you want to ceremonially do certain... There's nothing wrong with doing things because they're, they're just right and, and good to do. If you want to take a day of rest, and I think you should, but you're on the Lord to do it. So, you don't throw the, bath, you don't throw the baby out with the bath water. A lot of the principles that were given in the Old Testament are good principles, but you're not under the legal law. So if you want to say, well, you know, it's a day, I want to take a day of rest, whether it's on a Saturday or a Tuesday or whatever day, it's good to take a day's rest. That's just right to do. That's a good principle, but it's not a law. All right. So your law is to, is to obey, is to know Jesus in the pardon of your sins. That's the only thing you have to do to please God. Everything else you do because you are thankful to God. And you don't earn anything because of that uh, from, a, from a salvation standpoint. Now, we will see later on as we go through this that you do get rewards 
and um, and and, uh, and benefits and um, that we will that you will be able to receive in eternity for for activities that you did, but not salvation. Salvation is given; it's a free gift to anyone that would desire to receive it. All right, I think I've uh, hit that one good enough. Let's move along to our next portion. Any comments on that? All right. Let's look at 51. Even of the Sabbath. Story 51. The man with the withered hand. And departing from there, it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he went and he entered again into a synagogue and taught. And behold, there was a man there who had his right hand withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees were watching him, whether on the Sabbaths he would heal him. And they questioned him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbaths, that they might find an accusation against him? But he himself, knowing their thoughts, said to them, What man among you, who has one sheep which falls into a ditch on the Sabbath, would not lay hold on it and lift it? He said to the man who had the withered hand, Rise up and stand here. And rising, he stood. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you about something. How much better, therefore, is a man than a sheep? Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. So it is lawful on the Sabbaths to do good. And looking around on all of them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their heart, he then said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored, whole as the other. But they were filled with anger, and the Pharisees went out and immediately took counsel with the Herodians, and spoke with one another against him about what they might do to Jesus, how they might destroy him. All right, so well, here we go, once again. This thing about the Sabbath was a big badge <clears throat> of honor to the Pharisees. And here's Jesus stripping this down. They were using this, the things that they don't do or the things that they do and how they control and their, their way of manipulating and controlling people by this rule that they had cleverly got people to, uh, to, uh, to agree to. Um, it's kind of like how we, 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 we've given up a lot of things uh, one of the things is our, our sense of privacy. You know, we've given that up because it was cleverly manipulated in our minds that, well, it's got to be done for safety. Well, but you know, there's a lot I can say about that, but one of the things I'll say is the, the, the scripture says that um, if, if we don't, if the Lord don't watch the, the house, the watchman watches in vain. So our safety doesn't matter about how many arms we got and how many militaries, what we got. Our safety depends upon what the Lord is doing with us and, and through us and he will get guide us but with that being said my point here is that it's important for us to recognize that um, uh, we we are following the Lord and we're looking to him uh, to, to, to guide us and to show us through whereas the Pharisees were looking to look impressive they were all about how do I do and, and the Sabbath day laws was one way that they did it uh, and they, they, they had a stronghold on this and the people agreed with it uh, once again like I said through their ability to manipulate and to convince them of things that uh, a lot of times the, the, uh, the people were not aware of that they were being maneuvered into situations that were going to entrap them into confinement uh, emotionally, spiritually uh, um, and Jesus is here to set them free so it goes on and says and Departing from there, he came. It, it came to pass also on another Sabbath. So here he is on another Sabbath day. He's dealing with this. That he went uh, and he entered again into the synagogue and taught. Now we talked about this before about how when it says Jesus went into a synagogue and he taught, and we just it's just you know just a little worry. But what we can keep in mind is that he had some I'm sure some important things to say. He has some things to say about what he was here to do, um, uh, who his uh, 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 um, followers, or, or how you could be a follower, I should say, uh, of him. And uh, 
some of the uh, the instructions about the death, burial, and resurrection that he was uh, 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 beginning to allude to and to show people up of. And so you can imagine that he taught. Uh, we don't have the actual verbiage of what he said, but we just don't want to go past that. We want to make sure that we recognize that he was in a synagogue and he was teaching the people. All right, and, it says, and behold, there was a man there who had his right hand withered. All right, and it lets us know specifically that it was his, uh, his right hand. Uh, when we look at uh, the fact that we're going through this, looking at uh, the combined Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you would notice that the, the Gospel that points out that his hand was right was the Gospel of Luke. And um, uh, Luke, being the physician, would be very much aware of those types of details, you know, being a physician. So his right hand was with it. And the scribes and the Pharisees. Right? So once again, we got these same two groups. These religious people. Now, keep in mind, I can't emphasize this enough. These are not um, uh, uh, people that don't believe in the laws of Moses. Now, the, the scribes, they don't believe in eternal life. They were more secular. They were more of your, your scientific type of, of, of leader. But the Pharisees were very uh, uh, God-believing and believing in the miracles and the works of God. But they were, both of their religious practices, be it secular practices or, or believing in miracle religious type of practices, were still based upon self-grandization. They wanted to just look wonderful in front of the people. And so you got these two groups here. And we're going to see a third group here brought, brought in, in just a bit. We'll talk about them in a minute. It says, and they were watching him, whether he, uh, whether on the Sabbath he would heal uh, him. He, and so they're there. Now, we go back to what we just said. Jesus was in the synagogue, and he what? And he taught. But what were they focusing on? They weren't. Paying, they, you hear nothing about them trying to understand what it was that Jesus talked about. What did he teach? What instructions did he give? That's not why they're there. And there's a lot of folks that are not in church for, and that they don't go to, to any type of gathering for no other reason than to solidify their authority and their power of being the man. You know, I, I want to be the it. And um, you have to be careful with that. It's not in every place, but it's in enough places where it's a problem. And of course, in Jesus' day, it was a big problem. All right? And so, um, they were watching to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath. And he says, uh, and they questioned him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So, they want to throw Jesus a question so that they could trap him. All right? And Jesus showed them the ridiculousness of their question. It says that they, and the reason why that question, that they might have an accusation against him, right? Because they want to accuse Jesus, and that's why the Sabbath was so important to them, because they could use the Sabbath to manipulate people, like they are doing with Jesus. They would do that to the common person. Well, and people do that, you know, today. You know, they'll take portions of Scripture and they manipulate it and they'll use it to try to get people to do what they want pe people to do. And that's how they can control folks. You know, they'll say something like, you know, the Bible says that you should obey your ruler. It says, I'm the, I'm the elder or I'm the, the ruler of this, this, this gathering. If you disobey me, you disobey in the Bible because the Bible says obey your rulers. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you get into those types of things and, you know, and people, they, they flip that around all different kinds of ways. And that's just one simple way that I bring it up. But it gets, it gets deep. And this whole thing about the Sabbath with the Pharisees was deep. There's uh, so many things that they were that they had written. It was just line upon line and, 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 and page after page of rules and regulations on what you could and could not do, all for the purpose of manipulating and controlling their circumstances, mainly the people for whom they were uh, supposedly been teaching. But yet Jesus was there teaching. But now here's the Pharisees questioning him about the Sabbath, not on anything that he taught. They don't care about what he's teaching, you know, which is a sad thing. All right. It says, but he himself knowing their thoughts. So Jesus knows. I know you're trying to trap me. I know you're trying to get me to say something so you can accuse me of something uh, 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 wrong. And I understand your method and your motive for why you're doing it. So Jesus knowing their thoughts said unto them, 
What man among you who has one sheep which has fallen into a ditch on the Sabbath would not lay hold on it and lift it? So he's showing them a practical truth here. If you if you go on out and you're heading out somewhere and one of your sheep fall into a ditch, or you gonna say, "Well, I gotta leave him there because it's the Sabbath day. I can't spend no energy lifting this sheep out of the ditch. That's work." He goes, "No. Every one of you would take that sheep and lift them out." So what he's trying to point out is, look at how ridiculous your your your. The, the, the confines that you're trying to put people in are. Right? And so he's letting them know you would break the Sabbath too if you had a sheep that was trapped. But look what he does. And he said unto the man who had the withered hand, rise up and stand here. So he called the man forth. He said, come on up here. And, and rising, he stood. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you uh, about something. How much better, therefore, is a man than a sheep? Now, if every one of you would lift the sheep out the ditch. Now, here's a man. He's not in a natural hole in the ground, but he's in a he's in a a a, a, a physical uh, 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 and, and and personal ditch of his own, where he his right hand is unusable. And so Jesus is saying, "Now I'm going to pull him out of his circumstance." All right. And so he says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? So now Jesus is asking him questions, them questions. He asks another one. All right. How much better is a man than a sheep? Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? These are Jesus' questions. But they were what? Silent. That no one's gonna answer because they couldn't answer. Because see, Jesus had them. Just, see, they tried to, they tried to trap Jesus with their words and with their customs. But what Jesus did, he just flipped that right on them and trapped them to the point where they couldn't say anything. Because remember, Jesus is the master. You're not going to outslick Jesus. He's God. You're not going to outslick him. You're not going to outthink him. You're not going to get. You, you're not going to beat him at any kind of game. And they just would not understand that because they would not accept him for who he is. All right. And so he says, he says, so it is lawful on the Sabbath to do good. He took their silence for, then I guess it must be good, right to do good. And looking around on them with anger. See, now he's upset because they don't want truth. They want authority and power. See, if they wanted to know the truth, and therein is the problem. When people are trying to do religious things for power and for prestige and for uh, appeal, you, you have the wrong motive. You should seek God and try to know him because you believe that God is going, it's all truth, he's all good, and he's going to give you truth. You're going to get to know what is real about your situation. Uh, am I really uh, a, a perfect person? No. It's going. To, God's going to tell you the truth. Well, then, can I get to God being a perfect, not being a perfect? Person? No. Well, that means I can't get to God. Yes, you can. How? Because I'm going to give you perfection that was earned by Jesus, and I want to cover you in it. That's truth. If you desire to know the truth, the Bible says the truth will make you what free. But if you don't want truth, it puts you in bondage. And so these people will stay in bondage. And that's why the Lord looks upon them with anger. Because they choose to stay in bondage. Rather than to accept the truth that was offered by Jesus. And so he looked about them with anger. Because these are the leaders supposedly supposed to be teaching the people. And being grieved. So he was anger and sad. And grieved. For the hardness of their hearts. That they just would not just give in and say, we don't know it all, but you do. We want to follow you. That's why you call somebody, that's why we call him Lord. I call Jesus my Lord because I know he knows what I don't know. I call him my Savior because he gives me eternal life that I couldn't earn myself. So he's my Lord and my Savior. You see? 
So, um, so he was angered and grieved for the hardness of the heart. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And uh, his hand was restored whole as the other. So now his hand is restored whole, just like the other hand. But they were filled with anger. So now who? Now the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now they're filled with anger. Right? Why? Because they have been out slicked. Their, their ability to try to trap Jesus and Jesus trapped him. But yet they couldn't say anything wrong. They couldn't say he did something wrong by healing this man because Jesus already set the precedent. Is it, is it right to do uh, good on the Sabbath or evil? To heal, to heal or to kill. So he said, Jesus set the precedent and it showed them in many different angles. Just like with the Sabbath day situation when they were taking the grain. He showed them many angles on how if you really understood scripture, you would see how there was no problem here. And once again, if you really understood what uh, uh, the scripture is trying to teach, you would see there's no problem here. But they're trying to live in this situation. Well, when I say live in this situation, they're trying to live in a situation of authority and power based upon rules. All right. Now, um, the Pharisees, the Pharisees went out and immediately took counsel, not with God. They didn't go and seek God, but they knew they needed help. But when they asked for help, they didn't go to God. Look what they, it says they immediately took counsel with the Herodians. Now, who are the Herodians? The Herodians are people that were uh, of Jewish descent that had pretty much abandoned the allegiance of the religious order. Uh, as far as having any leadership or rule there and began to have uh, uh, offices and rank amongst the Roman uh, allegiance. So they were part of the Roman allegiance. So when things were going on in the, uh, the Hebrew town, in the Jewish town, the Herodians were ones that would go back and let Roman, let the Rome know what was going on. They, they had signed uh, openly, my allegiance is to Rome. And that, that, that's what you call people that, that say, well, if you can't beat them, join them. Yeah. Well, we couldn't beat Rome, so I'm just going to join them. And that's what the Herodians, and they were not liked. The Pharisees and the Sadducees did not like the Herodians because they said, you guys are sellouts. You should be helping us destroy Rome, and yet you're joining them. Well, now, because the Sadducees and the Pharisees who have come together, and keep in mind, the Sadducees and Pharisees, they don't like each other either, but they have come together already. But now they're joining up now with this other group called the Herodians. So now you've got the Sadducees and Pharisees and now the Herodians. You know, and uh, we also saw that we had the scribes. And, and so now they, take, they, they took counsel with the Herodians and they spoke with one another against him. Against who? Against Jesus. About how they might... Uh, 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 what they might do to Jesus, how they might destroy him. So, right off the bat, I don't want to learn from him. I don't want truth. He's messing up the way we have it set up here. I want to destroy him. Right? So, that's what they're seeking to do. They're seeking to destroy uh, our Lord and Savior. Alright? Uh, we got one little story here that we're going to finish up and then we're going to be done uh, for today. Let's take a listen to story 52. Story 52, Jesus heals the crowds by the sea. And Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there to the sea with his disciples. And a great crowd from Galilee, and also from Judea followed him, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and beyond the Jordan, and the region of Tyre and Sidon. A great number of people heard of all that he was doing, and they came to him, and he healed them all. And he told his disciples that a boat should be waiting for him because of the crowd, so that they would not be pressing on him. For he had healed many, with the result that all those who had afflictions were falling on him in order to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God! And he earnestly warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, 
my beloved one, in whom my soul delights. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A crushed reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out, until he leads justice to victory. And on his name, the Gentiles will hope. Story 15. All right. So here, once again, a very uh, simplistic story here, story 52. And we see here that uh, Jesus is healing by the crowd. Now, he just got finished healing an individual that had a withered hand. But he did this on the Sabbath day. It says, and Jesus, aware of this, he was aware of what? What had happened in the previous one, that they were seeking and taking counsel to do what? To destroy him. So he recognizes, you know, I know these people want, to, want me out of here. They want to kill me. Uh, he withdrew from there uh, to the sea with his disciples. So now he withdrew from there and he's, he, he's going there with his disciples, those that are following him and that are listening. One of the things about being a disciple of Jesus means that you're, you're listening to his teachings. You recognize he has truth that you don't have. And I'm trying to receive it. All right? And that's a beautiful aspect about what a disciple is. Uh, and a great crowd. So here we go with the crowd again, right? From Galilee and also from Judea. Followed him. So he's got the great crowd following again. A bunch of people. Uh, it says, and from Jerusalem and from uh, uh, Idumea and from beyond Jordan. And from the regions of Tyre and Sidon. A great number of people heard of all that he was doing. And they uh, came to him. So here we go. Once again, the word is out. And every time the Pharisees try to trap him, he has a way of throwing it back on him. And that also gets the attention of the people. That the Pharisees, these people who manipulate and get us to do all kinds of stuff by tricking us, by using you know, clever words within the, 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 the teachings of Moses. Jesus is not able to be trapped like that. They're, and they're impressed with that. Plus, he's healing individuals. So they're showing his wisdom, his knowledge, his ability to speak truth, and his power to heal. And he told his disciples uh, that a boat should be waiting for him because of the crowd. So that uh, they would uh, not pass, that would not be pressing on him. So he wanted to get into a boat to kind of pass through so that he didn't have to go through the crowd. He can go through on the sea. For he had he had healed many. All right, so once again, he's healing more. And, and like we said sometimes when we were talking about how when the Bible says Jesus taught. It's just a quick statement, but you got to keep in mind that he's doing activity. And it's not, not something that just took a second. It's, he's there explaining. Well, even here, and he healed many. Well, it's just a quick way of saying something. But you can imagine the line of people, the people coming up, the press, the people trying to get there. You can almost imagine it's a whole lot more involved than just sometimes how we just would say it. With the result that all those who had afflictions were, were falling on him in order to touch him. Uh, whenever the unclean spirit, so not only is healing people with afflictions, but also clean, healing people that have what? An unclean spirit. Saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, you are the son of God. So now these unclean spirits know who he is. And remember Jesus had told them before, don't say anything. Remember when he cast out those unclean spirits and had them go into the, the swine? He said, don't say uh, or who I am or what I, uh, uh, I've come in. Because he didn't want them proclaiming who he was. Alright. Uh, and it says, and he earnestly warned them not to tell who he was. Alright. Uh, this was so to fulfill what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. And it says here, and, and this is in, and if you uh, look for this, this is Isaiah chapter 42, uh, verses 1 through 3. And, it's, uh, and it says, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen. All right, this is my servant is who? Jesus. My beloved one whom my soul delights. So he's chosen Jesus, and Jesus is his beloved, his beloved of the Father, and, and his soul delights, meaning he's doing what he's supposed to do. 
I will put my spirit upon him. All right. So once again, remember, when Jesus came, he did what? He stripped himself. And so the spirit of, of God, of who he is, is awakening or coming upon him or you know, just having a lack of the vocabulary to explain what's happening in the Godhead, which is what this is. Jesus is uh, the spirit of, 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 of God that is who Jesus is, is becoming uh, uh, illuminated in him. And he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. All right? So he's already proclaiming justice to those that have been oppressed by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're beginning to see and to recognize. And will not quarrel, nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice uh, in the street. All right? So you know, he's not uh, trying to make himself look wonderful by having all of that, those, those different uh, uh, loud sayings and all those different uh, verbose conversations. He speaks the truth. All right? And uh, he's not trying to impress anybody. And it says, a, 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 a crushed reed or a bruised reed, he will not break off. So if you are connected, but you are, you've been bruised. So there are a lot of people that love God. And this is an important portion of scripture here. And they're connected to, to, to the word of God and they're connected to, to maybe a, a church or, or something. And they love the Lord. But they've been getting all kinds of crazy information. And they got to the point where they just they don't even like going to church anymore. They don't even want to go anymore because they're seeing so much going on. And that's what the people were seeing. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had done so much to the people were just discouraged. Because they felt like we're just being manipulated. We're being taken advantage of. And, but yet they, they want to know who God is. And so they're hanging on, but they're bruised. And so what uh, Jesus, uh, is, uh, what it's saying here is when Jesus finds these people, they really want to know God, but they've been, uh, they've been abused, abused by the religious system. He goes, uh, they, I won't break them off. He goes, I want to help them. Because they're trying to find God, but the system that they're involved with is, is just breaking them down. And if you bruise something long enough, it could break off. But Jesus says, I'm not going to allow it to break off. I'm going to give them truth. And it says, and a smoldering wick I will not put out. And once again, you know, sometimes when you're trying to, you're trying to do for the Lord, sometimes you get on fire for the Lord. You want to do. And you get ready to do. And you go out and you get involved with an uh, organization or you know, a, a denomination or something, and you get involved, you're on fire, but after a while, it just, you just lose all your, your, your energy and your fire. And all you, you, you're, not, you're not a flaming fire anymore. You're just, you're just a smoldering little ember that's just barely going on. And what Jesus is saying that when, you, when you've been beat down to the point to where you lost all your fire, you have no more, but you still want to know who God is, but you just, I can't do this anymore, and I can't go through that, and I can't allow them to manipulate me anymore. He goes, that smoldering wick, I'm not going to put it out. I'm not going to put the fire out. I'm going to help him. Alright? He says, he, he won't break off the reed, nor a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. See? So he's going to bring truth. He's going to bring the justice out. And on his name, the Gentiles will hope. He's going to give those that want to look for God hope. All right? And he speaks specifically of the Gentiles. Because right now, um, we're, we're in the process of watching the Jewish people, who are the God's chosen people, reject him. And Jesus is going to be um, presented to the Gentiles, who, is, who are you and I. But, then the, but we don't want to keep it, we don't want to get uh, 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 off base and think that God is finished with his chosen people. He is not. He is still going to use them and going to use them mightily coming down towards the end of times. All right. So we're going to stop here and uh, we'll pick up again, Lord willing, on next week.